All right, here's what we're going to do today. As promised, we're going to wrap up um, the talk that we began last time about typography, whereas we talked and we compared typography to clothing, and we talked about what some of the functions of the clothing were and how they relate to typography. Um, I think we talked about functional, and we talked about what are tools of our trade-off for typography. What is it that we can change? And what we need to do is look at the other four uh, items on our list. Uh, in other words, other purposes for typography be behind the, the, the purely functional, uh, that is legibility. I'm then going to talk a little bit about our next assignment, and then we're going to have movie day. All right, we'll have movie day today and on Wednesday. And then we'll have some discussion after that. All right? If I recall, the five purposes that we define for typography are number one, function, functionality. And really, the main point with that is legibility. I guess we could call some of these other items that we're going to discuss down there are a kind of functionality, which they are, but for the most part when we talk about functionality, we'll talk about just handling the very basic things that you can read it. All right. We then talked about, and I am not sure of the order, and let's see if I can do it from memory. I cheated and looked at the picture yesterday, so it won't be a purely from memory, but one of the things that we said was appropriateness. Expression The last one I know was special meaning Attractive appearance, thank you together. Uh, and, and, and it's funny, uh, depending on who you talk to, you know, <clears throat> we might talk about attractiveness as being different than functionality, which I would say it is. But there are some people that would argue the attractiveness of a page makes it more functional. You know, you are more likely to look at a poster that looks attractive than a poster that doesn't look attractive. All right? And, and so on. Um, something that you like, something that you have uh, some emotional reaction to, you're likely to connect with more than something that you dislike. There's a whole, um, there's a good book written by uh, Don Norman, it's called Emotional Design, and he's talking more about the design of physical things than web pages, but there's parallels as well. That if you like something, you know, like you like your iPod, you'll put up with its flaws. So if there's something a little bit wrong with it, if you like it, you'll tend to use it more and, and, and you'll get greater functionality out of it. So, we talked about our tools in our toolbox are the font face, you know, serif, sans serif, and all the different font faces that we could have. Size, color, I'll call it decoration. And by decoration, I mean things like underline, bold, italics. It's not really decoration emphasis, I guess. Sometimes it's called weight, I think. And then lastly, we talked about the white space, the space between the words as being having the potential to convey information. So keep those on our mind as we go through this. So these are the things that we can do with typography. Let's talk about how they relate in each of these four categories. We talked a little bit about how they relate to legibility last time, or we talked a fair amount how they relate to uh, legibility. Let's go down the list. How do these things relate to appropriateness? 
the appropriateness of a font. How do font face, size, color, and so on relate? Depending on whether it's a title or part of the body, we saw that they, okay. they've used right. serif fonts for titles. Using different fonts for the usage of it. For example, headings versus the body of the text. So for headings, it may be more appropriate to use a serif font for body bulk text, especially on screens, it might be appropriate for a sans serif font. What's another example of appropriateness? Yes. Yeah. Is appropriate to the content. So that's another example. So the, the, font, the, the font choices are appropriate to the um, kind of content, kind of content like header and all that, but you're right, to the target audience, all right, and the people that it was appealing to. And just the tone of the message, you know. We looked at Apple having a very sleek presentation, whereas New York Times having a very classic looking uh, presentation. What's another kind of appropriateness? where our font choices come in. It's sort of related. Again, with these, these, all these tend to cross over a little bit, so. What I'm thinking, what should you read before you sign any contract? The small print. The fine print, right. So the idea of the fine print, you know, people joke about it like, you know, they're, and they probably shouldn't joke about it because they probably are trying <laughs> to sneak one past you. But the idea is, that there's a sense, there's an appropriateness between how you present something and its importance. All right. So, for example, if you had something that was important, people's bigger font equals more important. So, if I had two paragraphs up here, one was written bigger than the other, you're going to notice the bigger one more than you're going to notice the smaller one. All right. Now, hopefully, we're doing that to communicate what's really important. You know. Uh, and hopefully we're not doing that to try to manipulate our audience, all right? But, again, even with that, you have that. They remember that there's a famous thing of, of, you know, if you look at famous historical events throughout time, Man Walks on Moon, Dewey Beats Truman, all those things are in gigantic headlines because they were important, all right? They were very important. So the appropriateness of your font choices relates to even the importance of the content. I think expression is sort of the same thing. We want uh, the expression to match sort of the message. All right? We express something about it if we use a smaller font. We're making the expression that this is less important. We express something if it is in a different color font, that it is different than everything else on the page. Right? If we had a page where all the print was black and there was one section of the page that was red, that would tell you something. That would express something. All right. Our general choices of colors express things. Again, you know, typically for a very formal organization, you know, like a newspaper, it's black print on a white background. For something that's more fun, it may be more colorful. All right. You may use different colors uh, for that. An environmental organization might use green, for example, and a palette of earth tones because that is that that reinforces the message that they're trying to get across. So it's part of the expressiveness. Attractive, as we did note, attractive is in the eye of the beholder, but by picking appropriate color combinations, fonts, and all that, we aim to make the fonts more expre uh, expressive. Finally, special meaning. We talked about special meaning in clothes as being things like police officers wear different uniforms than the general population. Football teams. One team wears one color, one team wears another color. Soccer teams, the goalie wears a different uniform than the other uh, members of the team, you know. And the referees wear different uniforms still, all right. All these things are giving special meaning to, to this. What are examples of how we can give special meaning through our typography, and what are some ways that we can do that? How do we distinguish that something is different than the other stuff on the page? Or why would we want to? What are some examples of stuff different on our page than, than other stuff and how we designate that? There was a severe weather warning on a news page. You might put it right up at the top. Yeah. 
some kind of severe weather warning, for example, or some kind of breaking news, something that is critical, important. Our positioning of it, how can we do it with all these things? Font face, we might use a different font face. Size, we might make it bigger. Color, we might use a, uh, might use a color that stands out. Decoration weight, we could have it underlined, we could have it bolded, we could have it italics. White space, we could have it set apart from the other content so it doesn't all sort of merge together. All right? What's well, another example? That's a great example. Can anyone think of another example? What was the question again? How can we use typography to indicate some sort of special meaning about content on our web page? One thing we said is something that was breaking news, sort of warning, something that's very critical. We could bigger font, different font, different color, maybe set it apart via white space. Okay. Yes. Maybe like on websites that are like eBay or Amazon and like there's a certain like sale or some like percentage off. Okay. To show some sort of discount. You might show a discount a certain way. All right. Um, we might show a price even a different way to make it stand out, you know. If you go to a web, web page that's selling a product, you know, certainly one of the things you're interested in if you're shopping for it is the price. So you might do things via your typography to make that stand out. One of your choices, again, any mix of these things will do it. All right, different color, different font face, different size, or maybe by white space. This is the one that people sometimes forget about, all right, that just putting more space between something and everything else tends to make it stand out. All right? And so by doing that, that makes it stand out. So I'm thinking of a couple other things. A quote. If I quote someone, I might show it in a different font to indicate that it is someone else's words as opposed to mine. I might put it in italics, for example. All right? Or I might indent it more. I might put you know, <coughs> bigger margins, more white space on both sides. All right? Um, if it's a sort of a sidebar to a main article, you know, if, I think I can use this joke again because I use this in one of my other classes. If, for example, I was doing an article about Beyonce's performance a couple Sundays ago, and I wanted to have a sidebar about, oh yeah, there was also a football game that went on the same day, all right, I could have the one article, the main article styled one way, I could have the sidebar styled a different way. A sidebar being uh, an article that's related to the main article, but like from a different perspective or a different slant, you know, additional information. That's one thing that's great about the web is that it can give, and again, we sort of got on this when we talked about uh, the Martin Luther King one, is it can give different levels of information depending on the person's interest, all right? So, for example... And magazines do this all the time, too, but I think with web, you have a lot more flexibility. So you can have, for example, a main article, all right? You can then have a sidebar or several sidebars, maybe about related topics. And the idea is, if you're really interested, you'll go and read those. But if you just want the main point, you'll just read the main article, all right? And you can provide links and all sorts of things like that, all right? So you can give, you can let the person drill down to as specific as they want to, all right? I guess links are an example of special meaning. We typically show our links looking different than the other stuff because that gives people an idea, hey, these aren't just words, they are links. That's one reason why we rarely underline something on web pages that's not a link because by default, links on a web page are blue and underlined. Now, you can make them look any way you want to, but that's the default. So a lot of people are used to seeing blue underlined text and thinking it means a link. So if you make something blue and underlined, you're going to have people clicking on it and scratching their head when nothing happens. So you want to avoid you doing that. That would just be like, you know, you wouldn't want to go to a football game and wear a referee's jersey and be, and be, and be, if you're the water boy and you're standing on the sideline or something, right? Because everyone's going to think you're a referee and, and wonder why you didn't throw a penalty flag or something. So you don't want to have to dress up in the special clothing or the special typography if you're not that. So the other thing about special meaning, again, is grouping, I guess I would put into that. Just as 
wearing the same clothes, groups the football team together, putting things in a consistent way, whether it be the same color, the same font, and so on, is an indication that they're logically grouped together. They mean the same thing. One of the, remember, one of the big uh, rules I would say about typography is like things should look the same. So you should not have links where every link looks different. Because then the person viewing that page doesn't get a sense for what does it mean, you know, what are the links on this page? If one of them is blue and underlined, the other is red and italics, and the third is green bold. You know, you don't give a sense for that. Users are going to look, and your typography is going to sort of educate them in a subliminal, subtle way about how your web page works. All right? And therefore, you want to be consistent, and you want to give a consistent meaning. So things that are of similar importance should look similar. Things that are of a different importance should look different, either higher or lower. And again, typically, for importance, size is often there. But you can also use these other techniques as well. All right. One thing to remember is we're throwing out a lot of things here, and the temptation sometimes is to throw them all into one single document. All right. So do everything. You know. Um, one of the the key things about designing something, whether it be typography or use of images or anything, is to avoid the overkill. You know, it's not a case of, gee, we learned about fonts, so I will use six different fonts on my page. All right? It's like the person that is always screaming. Right? If you're always changing the font, all right, then if someone sees a font change, they don't think it means anything. All right? If, however, everything on the page is the same font except one thing, that one thing stands out. So by being very careful about what you do, you're sending messages, and again, you're teaching people what, how your page is structured so they can, at a glance, get a sense of how your page is structured. So, your next typography assignment is to design a book cover. All right? And specifically for this book, and I have a link to the Amazon page for it. And I'll bring, I have this book, I'll bring it to lab. Anyone wants to take a look at it, they're welcome to. All right? This book is, is, is a great book. That's one of the reasons I picked it. And I think there's a lot of potential um, for designing good book covers here. So I'll be real curious to see um, what you come up with. But you can take a look, look through it. In addition, you can look at the reviews on Amazon. You can get some quotes from people about what they said about the book. I want you to design a front and a back cover. Now, you're welcome to use more than words if you want to. But the focus probably should be on the typography. So don't have it all images. You know, make sure that there's sufficient words to explain that. You know, think about who the audience is. Who's going to buy a book like this? What kind of things are going to uh, catch that person's attention? What kinds of things are uh, in concordance with the topic of the book? And that's where, again, if you flip through it, maybe read a chapter of it or read the reviews on Amazon, read the description on Amazon, you can get a sense. So you'll design a front cover and a back cover. All right. Keep in mind that you should put some of the things that are typically on books. You know, you need to include the author. You need to include the title of the book. They have sort of a second heading. They have a little quote here. And on the back, they always have quotes. And then there's information concerning the publisher and pricing information. So you know that that's part of your requirements that you need to have, you know, you need to include that, all right, in, in there. So that's your task, to so design a front and back cover for this book. You can see what they did, use that as ideas, but who knows if they got it right. Don't assume that just because someone professional did it, that they did a great job. All right? Questions about that? Okay, we're now going to watch the movie Helvetica. And we're going to watch it... Um, as much as we can today, and we will then watch the remainder of it, or most of the remainder of it, on Wednesday. And then we'll have a discussion about the relevance of it and what I feel the takeaways are. A few things to remember, that the people that they are interviewing are people that spend their lives, many of them are people that spend their lives designing fonts, right? So they're, like, into this. 
all right? It's like you talk to anyone. You talk to, what's that movie about the guy that, that, that had the high score in Donkey Kong? You know, he's in it. He lives it, he breathes it, he sleeps it, you know? So us that, you know, have to wear many different hats and aren't strictly typography people might say, oh my God, I can't believe they're going into this much detail. But that's their jobs, right? You better be into it if that's your job. And you're going to get a variety of viewpoints and a variety of expression of alternatives and controversies. And there's going to be people that are going to speak very passionately. You're, you think they're talking about the presidential election or something. They get so fired up. All right. But again, it's important to see these things, to see what, as a designer, your choices are concerning uh, Helvetica is one of the most famous, famous fonts in the world. On Windows, there is a Helvetica clone known as Ariel. I will not record this portion of the lecture, just in case that that violates some copyright law.